Okay, so today what we're going to do is we're going to start talking about orthography. And as you've noticed, there isn't a chapter in the book about orthography, and that's why I've posted a couple of readings. How many of you have actually read the readings, or at least skinned them, or at least downloaded them and saw the titles? Okay, great. Yay! I didn't mean to like get anyone in trouble. <laughs> like, oh, you bad people, you didn't do it. No, I, I'm really glad that you did. Because what you'll see is that a lot of what we're talking about this weekend, even our discussion of the different layers of English, you'll see where I got some of my sources from as well. So I think that it's helpful for you to have the additional reading source. And I think that there are also some really terrific articles. So today what we're going to do is we're going to start by talking about what orthography is. And orthography is the study of writing systems. And there are many different kinds of writing systems. So we're going to start with orthography in general and look at the different kinds of writing systems and then look at what's unique about English. When we talk about orthographies, that word graph, that combining form, keeps showing up. So we've got orthography and we've got graphing. They're kind of related in meaning. So I know the definition is already there, so asking you, what's a graphing? It's the smallest unit of print. What's the basic unit? And it varies by language what that basic unit is. So in English, what's a graphing? What, wh what, are, what do we think of when we think of the graphemes? The letters. Excellent. Yeah. So we're going to be looking at what's represented. So what we find is that in English, the graphemes represent the phonemes. But what we find is that with orthographies in general, they don't have to represent the phonemes. They could represent different things. They could represent ideas. They can represent words. They could represent syllables or alphabets. For the alphabetic languages, we also find that they vary tremendously in terms of their depth. When we talk about depth, we talk about what's the relationship, what's the transparency between the sounds and the letters. So some languages, like Spanish, they're considered shallow orthographies. And what they mean by shallow is that they're pretty transparent. All you have to do is know the letters and the sounds, and you'll be able to sound out just about anything. There aren't a lot of exceptions. It's pretty predictable. Yep. Yep. So with a shallow orthography, a shallow orthography, another way of talking about it is also saying it's pretty transparent. So that just by knowing the letters and the sounds and how they go together, you can sound anything out. They're really predictable. <coughs> to give you sort of the opposite view, to contrast it with English, English is considered a deep orthography. That's because in English we have so many different exceptions. Just knowing the letters and sounds aren't enough. So when we talk about depth of orthography, some languages are very predictable. They're relatively easy to read. They're relatively easy to learn to do decode or sound out. So that I can read Spanish, or at least I could say I can decode it, even though I don't really understand what I'm reading. Growing up in Canada, I studied French instead. However, English is a much harder language. It's considered deeper. So that the letter E has different pro pronunciations based on what's around it. Does that make a little more sense to you? OK, and we're going to talk more about it later in today's class. Just th these are some of the concepts I want you to be familiar with. So. Some of the things that I want 
to get across to you is sort of what ideograms are. So ideograms are pictographs, and they represent con concrete objects, whereas ideographs can represent ideas. So the single line can represent one, the two lines over here are two, three lines representing three, this symbol representing above, this symbol, basically the symbol turned upside down, rotated 180 degrees, is below. So the smiley faces that you have in your texting, those would be considered ideographs. The winky face, the smiley face, the sticking out your tongue face. So even though we might think of ideographs as things from the past, they still exist today. Can you think of other examples in everyday life where you might see pictographs? Yep, so the picture of the cigarette with the red circle and the line going across it, what does it mean? No smoking, yep. Would logos count like a Nike symbol? Because that like, has a meaning in it. Yep, yep, those would be almost like um, ideographs. Yep. Yep, so some of the advertisements where the pictures represent, they stand for the different brands. Other things that you might find is, let's see, how do you know which restroom to use at a restaurant? when it doesn't have an M or a W on it. The picture is very often, you know, that circle with the triangle coming out and then the rectangle at the bottom and it's women and then the ones where it's just like the rectangles and all straight. Or sometimes the circles and the triangles represent male and female for the bathrooms. Um, other examples that you'll find in the household. Um, what's a picture of the hand where there's sort of like a dent going in the hand and drops coming down, what does that mean if you find it on a product? Mm, if you find it on a piece of cleaning, on like a, a can of cleaning solvent, one of the symbols that you might see is a picture of a hand with sort of a hole, a divot in the hand and drops coming down onto that. Corrosive. How about the skull and crossbones? Poison, yeah. Um, how about when you see a picture of an explosion on a can? Um, you see the flames for flammable? Explosive. So yeah, keep out of heat because it will explode. So what we do find is that we do still use the graphing um, that represent meanings. We find the pictographs and the ideographs in everyday life. And very often it's a way of communicating to people in a way that doesn't require literacy skills. Uh huh. So the difference is that pictographs are objects and the ideographs are ideas? Yep. Yep. You got it. And the cool thing is that now that you're learning about structural analysis, now that we talked about morphology, if you ever get confused, you can just look and do a little bit of structural analysis for yourselves and say, hmm, this idio reminds me of idea and picto reminds me of picture. So isn't it great when you can apply the skills from one week to the next week? Yay! <laughs> I get so excited about silly things. Okay, another big part of American culture is the use of hobo signs. And this was in the 30s during the Great Depression. And what people used to do is they used to leave marks in front of homes and communities um, by the railroads to give other people who are riding the rails information about that community. So, for example, this represents a picket fence. And so it's that diamond drawn on that picket fence that means that the place is good for a handout. Whoops! Okay. 
that it would let people know let other hobos know whether or not a place was safe to go to where they would be likely to get get a handout whether the whether getting locked up for the night in jail isn't is a good thing or a bad thing whether or not the food is bad or whether or not there are number 10 cooties in jail so cooties referring to lice um, so another example over here jail has rock pile don't want to go there or the w is um, jail is a workhouse whether or not the streets are good for begging or whether or not they're plainclothes detectives so it gives people information and shared information among the hobos in a way that wasn't letting the general community as a as a whole know how to navigate the new community okay And no, I will not ask you to memorize the different hobo signs. We also have log uh, logographies. And an example would be Chinese script. Now, when we talk about the logographs, each one, each of the characters represent a different word. That's not to say that the characters can't be broken down further but that the part that's meaningful, that can actually be taught just as is, are the characters themselves. And what I've got over here for flying machine, those are what these two characters represent, our translations from put together to create airplane. Um, kanji um, is derived from Chinese. And what we find is that mature readers of Japanese they have to not just be able to read the hiragana, they also have to be able to read the kanji characters. So what we find in the modern world is the use of logographies. Some of the history of the or, or the origins of Chinese was that the recognition that, wow, there are so many different languages spoken in China. And so what the emperor did was said, okay, we're gonna have a logography so that each character would represent a different word so that that way people could communicate through writing. Um, it would have the same translation, the characters would have the same translation across the different dialects and languages within China. Um, but even though they have different pronunciations, it, they share meaning. So there are different reasons behind different origins of different languages. I think I'm gonna end up throwing that chair just out of the door because no matter how far I push it to the side, I still trip over it. Okay. When we look at Japanese, children initially learn the um, hiragana. And each character represents a different sil a syllable. One of the things about Japanese that lends itself so well to having a writing system that represents syllables is that the syllable structure, there are a limited number of syllables to learn, and that it's an open syllable structure. So it's pretty predictable. So it's pretty consistent there's a lot of consistency and so that the way that words are created is that words are spelled by combining the syllables when linguists came to North America and was working with the Native Americans um, very often what they did was um, for example with Cherokee in developing a writing system they were also based on syllabaries because of the syllable structures so in teaching the um, syllable structures, that was one way of um, representing it. Now, when we look at alphabets, we often think, oh, OK, an alphabet. All alphabets are the same. But there are really three different kinds of alphabets. We've got the first kind are the syllabic al alphabets, also known as abugidas. And here's an example for, from Devangari. And what we see is that the pa looks very similar to pe, which looks similar to pe, which looks similar to pi. It's all based on the p consonant with the different vowels added, but a part of the same character. So does that make sense to you, the syllabic alphabets? So what you see is you've got the initial p 
And then whatever is part of the syllable is added right on to that same character. Then we have the abjads. And the abjads are basically alphabets in which most of the letters, almost all the letters, are consonants. And the vowels are marked by diacritical marks. Um, Arabic is a real bear to learn because each letter has like four different forms depending on is it by itself, is it at the beginning of the word, is it the middle of the word, is it the end of the word. Some of the letters, all four forms look pretty similar. Other letters, they look really different in all the different positions. So Arabic can be a real bear to learn. It's one, it's one of the harder alphabets to learn. Um, another thing also to keep in mind is that for mature readers of the abjads, you often see them written without any of the vowels included. You just see the consonants. The beginning readers, so um, up until about third grade, what you would see is um, the consonants presented with the vowels, with the diacritical marks. And then it's very transparent. It's very predictable. But then what happens is that you use your grammatical knowledge, your contextual knowledge, and in about third grade, mature readers of either Hebrew or Arabic, they don't have the vowels. They're just purely the consonants. Yeah? Uh, I was going to say, what would you consider Arabic? Um, Deep. Yeah. You need a lot of context. The abjads are, are, when they're fully marked up with all the diacritical marks, they're pretty transparent. So the, it's on the shallow end. But the way that mature readers read them, so like newspaper, newspapers, books, very often you'll see them, like this over here is Ivrit. And it, this consonant here, the ein, has no sound to it. It's just a placeholder for the vowel. This is the v sound, but sometimes it can have a b sound if it has a dot in the middle. But in mature writing, you won't have whether or not it has that diacritical dot. This is the ur, er, the resh the yud and the t. And depending on whether or not it has vowels, that would be marked with dots. Starting in third grade, kids stop seeing it with the vowels. So it becomes a much deeper orthography. And so whether it's a noun, the tense of the noun, that all gives away what the pronunciation is like. And so you have to use that sort of top-down knowledge. And Hebrew is a little easier than Arabic because it only has two forms. And most of the time, both forms look the same based on the position of the word. Um, there are only a few cases, and you see one, two, three, four, five, five cases in which it's context dependent where this is where it's at the end of the word. The rest of the time, this is what the letters look like. And Arabic, it's hard. 28 letter, this is 22 letters, this is 28 letters, four forms varying. It's a tough language to learn. <laughs> so um, it's also considered a deep orthography. And then we have the full alphabets. So we've got the Latin alphabet, which we use. We've got Cyrillic, the Russian alphabet. And we've got the Greek alphabet. And we call these full alphabets because every single phoneme well, all the consonants and all the vowels are represented by phonemes, uh, by graphemes. So there are letters representing all the vowels and all the consonants, as opposed to the abjads like Hebrew and Arabic where the consonants are represented, and as opposed to the syllabic alphabet in which one character represents the syllables, but it's based on the consistency of a consonant with a core that changes based on the vowels that are presented with it. Lots of fun, huh? OK. So just to get a sense, um, some of you might have seen this before, but just to get a sense of how, even with full alphabets, they vary. Got over here, the European Commission has announced an agreement whereby English will be the official language of the EU rather than German, which was the other possibility. A part of the negotiations, Her Majesty's government conceded that English spelling had some room for improvement, 
and had accepted a five-year phase and plan of modifications that will lead to Euro-English as the language will be known. In the first year, S will be replaced by the soft C, or S will replace the soft C. Certainly, this will make the civil servants jump with, the, with joy. The hard C will be dropped in favor of the K. This should clear up the confusion, and keyboards can have one less letter. There will be growing public enthusiasm in the second year when the troubles in PH will be replaced with the th. This will make the words like photograph 20% shorter. In the third year, public acceptance of the new spelling can be expected to reach the stage where more complicated changes are possible. Governments will encourage the removal of double letters, which have always been a deterrent to accurate spelling. Also, all will agree that the horrible mess of the silent E in the language is disgraceful and it should go away. By the fourth, fourth year, people will be receptive to steps such as replacing the TH with Z and W with V to better align the modified language vis the capabilities of the Euro speaker. During the fifth year, the unnecessary O can be dropped from words containing OU. Similar changes would, of course, be applied to other combinations of letters. After this fifth year, we will have a really sensible written style. There will be no more trouble or difficulties, and everyone will find it easy to understand each other. The dream will finally come true. <laughs> so what do you notice? Now we're getting into another aspect of orthography. Even though we're talking about alphabets, does this look like English? No. It looks nothing. What language do, do you think it kind of looks like? German. German. Yeah, it's got a lot of the sort of Germanic spelling rules. And what we see here, your sensitivity in noticing the difference with the spelling, is the giggles that were sort of coming up, kind of reflects your recognition that there are sort of spelling patterns that look like English and spelling patterns that look like other languages. And what we're going to do now is look a little bit at what makes the patterns of English unique. So when we look at alphabetic orthographies, one of the things that you should know is that the number of graphemes always matches the number of phonemes. Every single phoneme is represented by a grapheme. That doesn't necessarily mean, when we look at this a little further, is that it doesn't necessarily mean the number of letters always represents the number of phonemes, but the number of graphemes do. And that's because it reflects the orthographic depth of language. So changing the, replacing the PH in photograph to an F, what we're doing is we're changing the grapheme, the P, excuse me, the PH grapheme with the grapheme of F to make the F sound. So does that make sense to you, how you can have two letters representing a single sound? OK, good. With shallow orthographies, what we find is that the relationships between the graphemes and phonemes are consistent. They're predictable. So that it's, based, it's almost like if you have the code beside you, you can read that language. You might not understand a single word you read, if I were given the code for languages like Portuguese or Dutch, even though I don't speak a word of Portuguese or Dutch, I'd be able to sound out words once I learned the key. They're very predictable. So examples include Spanish and German. Deep orthographies have less consistent relationships between individual graphemes and phonemes. So that context might play a role. So an example would be English. Another example would be French. How many of you have studied French? OK, so only one of you. Have you noticed that when, you read, when you're reading, sometimes the final consonants are silent, and sometimes they're not? That's because you have to know the context. You have to have a greater understanding of French syntax. So it makes <coughs> French, reading French, less predictable than reading a language like Spanish because you don't always pronounce all the sounds. And there's been more comparison, comparing the depth of orthographies, how predictable orthographies are, and its relationship with learning to read. Does it make a difference? 
So some of the research that's been done in Europe, um, Heinz Wimmer and his colleagues, um, what they did was they looked at the depth of different orthographies. So Finnish is very transparent. There are a couple examples in Spanish and in German where there might be a, a couple changes in the pronunciation. Most of the time it's pretty good. Dutch and Swedish are a little deeper, a little less consistent. With French, you have it even less consistent. And English is the least consistent of the alphabetic languages in Europe. And what they wanted to do is compare reading development in developed countries with different alpha alphabets. Why do you think it's important that it was all European countries that they were comparing? Yeah, oh, sorry. Do you think it would be a fair comparison to compare reading um, Isuzulu to um, a European language? So that they would go to South Africa and some of the schools that are fairly isolated from the cities and have limited resources. So in comparing European schools in industrialized developed countries, the goal was to compare schools where they had westernized education and in which the level of education was pretty high quality. There was pretty much universal access to public education. So that way they wouldn't be confounding what the education systems are like with the literacy. That they wouldn't be com confounding developed countries compared to developing countries. And to give a sense of what they did is they had kids identify letters, they had them read familiar words, they had them do some phonological awareness tasks, but they also had them read made up words. Now, the reason why they had them read made up words was because they wanted to make sure that none of the kids would recognize the words, that they had to sound out the words. Does that make sense to you in using the made up words? Okay. Now, to show you the differences is that the examples, two examples that they had, throw and nor, or nour, or nur, different pronunciations, on average, just by manipulating, what they did was they manipulated um, the number names. What they found is that on average, there are about almost four different ways that you could read each of the known words for, the, for English. For French, there were about two different pronunciations. For Spanish, there were about 1.4 possible readings for the different made up words. And the Finnish, there was only one possible pronunciation. So what they did is they first wanted to confirm that the depth of orthography was related to how many different types of pronunciations a child could come up with for a particular word. And what they did was when the children read these made up words, they would accept any of the acceptable pronunciations. So in Finnish, there was only one acceptable answer. If there were four possible readings for N-O-U-R, they would accept all four possible pronunciations as the correct answer. So there wasn't one specific answer that they would accept. It just had to be legal according to the spelling rules of the language. And what they wanted to do is look at kids at different grade levels and see, does the structure of the language influence how easily they learn to read? And what they found at the end of first grade is that the British kids with the least consistent language, on average, were almost getting half of them. While as the other languages, which were more transparent, more predictable, they were getting them with close to 90% accuracy. By second grade, the English speakers were catching up at about 70% accuracy. And at third grade, they still were developing their skills at about 80% accuracy. By fourth grade, they all had about the same level of accuracy. The graph might have it look different, but statistically they were about the same. So what they were able to argue is that while 
there were differences among most of the languages in terms of their depth of orthography. English, which was the least consistent, was the hardest for learning. So the orthography can play a role if, with the ease of learning to read. Yep. It's a deeper orthography, yeah. Um, I'm not exactly sure. It was about as, I think that what happens is um, with greater practice, one of the things that you might find is that with deeper orthographies is that it forces you to focus more on meaningful units within the word instead of going by letter by letter. So with English, part of what happens is that when you start looking at prefixes and suffixes and the inflectional endings and the roots, it, and you start using that to figure out words, it starts boosting reading times and starts boosting accuracy. And I think that what may be happening with French is that kids are looking at the larger units earlier than the chunks within words, the endings within words, earlier than they would be if it was more transparent. So that might be the case that it's transparent enough that they get the connections. It's not as hard for them to learn the connections because it's more transparent than English. But they've kind of noticed the shortcuts in looking at the chunks sooner. So that, seem, that might be the case. Okay. In English, we have three different kinds of graphemes. We have the single letters, the digraphs, and we have trigraphs. And what you notice with these is that the digraphs are two letters that produce a single sound. The CK in duck, the SH in sh shallow, the double L in shallow, the trigraph TCH in the word itch or stitch. The WH in which is a digraph. So when we talk about graphemes, they can be <coughs> single letters, they can be digraphs, they can be trigraphs. And looking at these different units can be really helpful. Let's look at some of the things that make learning English challenging. So what are some of the things that you think make learning to read English so hard? Yeah. Yep, so for, we have with the letter C, just two different examples of how it can have the sound or the k sound. George Bernard Shaw had a great example of how to spell fish. Let's see. Oh, wait, sorry. I forgot the H. Okay, so the first, the first digraph is a GH. Can anyone think of an example where GH has a pronunciation? Enough. Pardon me? Enough. Enough or laugh. The next one is a single letter with the I pronunciation. Can you think of any examples where O has the I pronunciation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's think of, hmm, what word often comes with men? Women. And how is women spelled? W-O. So the O would be like the I, the I sound. And the last sound would be the sh sound, T-I. Like caution. Yep, caution, 
nation, fashion. So Shaw said, well, here's a perfectly legitimate way to spell fish. We've got all these analogies from other words. So one of the big challenges for learning English is the different spellings and the different pronunciations. There's debate in how many phonemes there are. There are 26 different letters, and they represent about 41 phonemes. When we look at the consonants, what we find is that the 24 consonant phonemes that we have have 219 different ways of spelling them. That means that every consonant has, on average, 9.1 different spellings. When we look at the letters, the consonant letters, the consonant graphemes, what we find is that on average there are two and a half different pronunciations. So here we're talking about going from um, speech to print. So each, each uh, pronunciation has about nine different spellings, and each consonant grapheme has about 2.4 different sounds, two and a half different sounds associated with it. So there's not a lot of consistency with the consonants. And the vowels are even more fun. The 17 vowel sounds have 342 different spellings. So there are fewer vowels, vowel phonemes, but there are more spellings associated with them. That translates to each vowel sound having about 20 different spellings. And when you look at an individual letter, the vowel letters, the vowel graphemes, what we find is that each vowel grapheme has about eight different pronunciations. So learning to spell in English can be really challenging if we look at that inconsistency. So when we're talking about a deep orthography, this is pretty deep. What do you think is more challenging for kids to learn to spell? Vowels or consonants? Yeah, vowels are a lot harder. And when you look at children's initial spellings, the mistakes that they make most frequently are in the vowels. When it comes to reading words, what do you think they're more successful with, the vowels or the consonants? They're more successful with the consonants. A strategy that beginning readers often make is that they'll look at the consonants, the first consonant and the last consonant, and kind of guess with everything in between. Because when they're just learning, when they're still learning the sounds, each letter can have about eight different pronunciations. So there's a lot of challenge in learning English. And there are some, a number of different reasons for the different vagaries. One thing is that in the 15th century, with the printing pre press, that's when English spelling became pretty formalized. But pronunciations have changed a lot in the last 600 years. But so the changes in the pr pronunciations don't, oh, the spellings haven't caught up with the pronunciations. Another reason why it's so challenging is that English is a great collector. It pulls in words from a variety of different languages. So remember how we talked about the four different layers of English? What were the layers? What was the first layer, the initial, that kind of serves as the basis of the name for English? The, the Anglo-Saxon. So, with Old English being Anglo-Saxon in its origins, those are Germanic origins. What was the next layer? Let's think of William the Orange. The French influence, where all of a sudden we get the OU pronunciation. Canadian and British and Commonwealth countries still preserve that OU spelling in words like color, but you don't see that in American spellings. That's also fun. Okay. Um, then what's the next layers? 
we've got the Latin layer. And that we find with the prefixes and the suffixes and the stems. And then we have the Greek layer. But then we have imported from other words, other languages. So what are other words that you can think of that have been imported into English from other languages? Khaki. Khaki? What language is that from? You know? Urdu, that's right. We have bungalow from Hindi. Pardon me? Rendezvous from French. And I can just think of, let's see, schlep. I've heard people say schlep. That's from Yiddish. I've also heard a wide range of colorful insults come in from Yiddish as well. But that might just be my family. Um, <coughs> so we have a lot of influence coming from other languages. And the origins of the languages the variety of different languages that have influenced English have led to different spellings. Another reason why English pronunciation is so challenging is because, as I mentioned before, it's morphophonemic. So the example that you've heard a gazillion times already and you're going to hear again is nation and national. That even though the pronunciation shifts, there's a vowel change with a change in the stress. It preserves the meaning of the word. So to illustrate how confusing English can be, I've got a nice little poem. I take it you already know of tough and bow and cough and dough. Others may stumble, but not you, on hiccup, thorough, laugh, and through. Well done, and now you wish, perhaps, to learn of less familiar traps. Beware of heard a dreadful word that looks like beard and sounds like bird, and dead it's said like bed, not bead. Watch out for meat and great and threat. They rhyme with sweet and straight and debt. A moth is not a moth in mother, nor not both in bother, broth and brother. And here is not a match for there, nor dear and fear for bear and pear. And then there's dose and rose and lose. Just look them up and goose and choose and cork and work and card and ward and font and front and word and sword and do and go and thwart and cart. Come, come, I've barely made a start. A dreadful language, man alive. I've mastered it when I was five. Isn't English fun? I actually had a conversation with my eight-year-old daughter yesterday. She asked, what's, what's, a, what's a sword? because she was using the analogy of word. And then I said, oh, no, no, that's one of the tricks in English. It's a sword. Oh, OK, I know what that is. And that gets to the issue of orthographic regularity and consistency. And regularity refers to the degree to which graphemes have the same pronunciation. How many of you remember back in elementary school and first grade and second grade when you talked about regular words? Words like cat and hat and bat and fat. Words that you could stand out using the rule. Well, that's when we're talking about regularity. Consistency is the degree to which letter patterns have the same pronunciation in different words. So here we're talking about word families. So we've got the at family that's consistent a lot of the time, but it's not always, because we've got cat and hat and bat and fat. But then we also have what? So when we talk about consistency, we're talking about larger units within words and how consistent the pronunciations are. Why do you think it's important to con consider consistency, not just regularity? Why do you think it, looking at just regularity isn't enough, especially with English? Mm -hmm. Because even if the letter is spelled the same way, it can still have 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and that you might have cases in which there's consistency, even though they're all breaking the rule. So what's the rule for double O that kids are taught? Ooh. Ooh. Okay. How about L double O K? How about C double O K? How about T double O K? How about H double O K? How about S P double O K? Spook is the only double OK word that has the OO pronunciation. The rest all follow the OOK rule, the cook, the look, the hook, the nook. So consistency, even though we've got these words, this group of words where they're all breaking the rule, they're all breaking the rule in the same way. So if we look at consistency, we actually find that English may be more consistent So another example would be the INT in mint and pint. That would be an example of where there are inconsistent pronunciations. And one of the things that I like to do is talk a little bit about friends and enemies. And we don't really have frenemies in, in this sort of context, but friends are orthographic neighbors that share the same pronunciation. So when we look at, in this case, gave and wave, they have the same pronunciation, so they'd be considered friends. Enemies are orthographic neighbors that have different pronunciations, like gave and have, or gave and swab. So orthographic neighbors, they only differ by a single grapheme. And if the orthographic neighbors, the parts that are the same, have the same pronunciation, they'd be considered friends. And if they have different pronunciations, you just change a single grapheme, and they have different pronunciations, the parts that remain, then they'd be considered enemies. And they could be based on different units of the word. So here we're looking at the, when we're looking at single syllable words that follow the CVC structure. Let's go back to syllables, just as a brief re review. So the word cat, just to remind you, the first consonant is what? The k. The vowel is what? Ah. And the second consonant? T. Right. So what does this remind you of when we look at breaking it down? We also have, what's the onset? Right. The onset is the k. The rhyme is the vowel and everything that comes after the vowel. And we also have the nucleus. What's the nucleus? Yep. And then we also have, what comes after? Coda. Coda, yay. So there are ways of looking at s simple words and looking at consistency of words and looking to see how meaningful they are. And are the onsets and rhymes psychologically meaningful things? So one thing that we can do is we could look at the consistency of words that vary in term, they have the same onset and nucleus, but the coda differs. And you have examples where they might be more consistent, so H-E-A, and it would have the heel, the heap, the here, 
but it could also be pronounced heart because it becomes a vowel theme, the heat, and the head. So for a more consistent, one of the things we find is that just knowing the start of the word doesn't necessarily give all the information about its pronunciation. Then with the CA, we have cab, cad, calf, cage, call, came, can, car, caught. So we have even more pronunciations. We can also look at them in terms of the rhyme consistency, looking at the nucleus and coda. So we had the app family, where there's cap, gap, lap, map, sap, swap, tap. So we have mostly friends with an, a single enemy here. A less consistent orthographic neighborhood based on the rhyme would be the double O-D. We've got blood, food, good, hood, mood, good, and wood. So even so, there still are uh, four different pronunciations. Now, one of the things that Becky Treeman has done with her colleagues is she's looked at the influence of grapheme phoneme consistencies on reading. So first she wanted to look at how consistent words are in terms of the pronunciation, looking at single syllable words. And her poor grad students, they were entering tons and tons of text into the computer and then finding out the pronunciations of all these words. And what she found is that for the initial consonant in words, so those in the onset position, their pronunciation was consistent about 94% of the time. When you look at the vowel, it's consistent about 62% of the time in single syllable words following the consonant vowel consonant structure. For words that, for looking at the final consonant, again you had greater 90% consistency. It was pretty predictable. So you see that for the words, we find that the vowels are a lot less consistent than the consonants, which we already talked about. Then in looking at the orthographic units, the larger chunks in orthographic neighborhoods, what she found is that pairing the initial consonant with the vowel brought down the predictability to about 55% of the time. But when you use the rhyme, then you increase the predictability of the vowel and the consonant to 80%. So she looked at this by type. So what, looking at type versus token. So with type, what it was was including all the single syllable words in text, how frequently this happened. So if the word top showed up five times, it was counted five times in this type count. For the token, what they did was, if the word top showed up five times, they only counted it once. Does that make sense to you? OK, so the consistency by type, in some ways, is weighted by the frequency of the words. And what you find is that when you look at just what the words were, we find that the vowel is even less consistent. So that the higher frequency words, the words that show up more often, make the vowels look a lot more predictable and consistent than they are when you just look at the words and count each word only, each unique word only once. But the overall patterns were the same. When looking at each of the different orthographic units, what she did was that she looked at words like cat and hat and bat and fat and looked at when C has the k pronunciation in the just the C as the initial consonant, what, how many different possible pronunciations are there in the dictionary? So looking at going from spelling to how many different pronunciations a consonant would have in the initial position. And it was relatively predictable. The vowel in the consonant vowel consonant words, the CVC words, had on average three, a little more than three pronunciations. And the final consonant had, on average, one and a half different pronunciations. When we combined, when she combined the initial consonant with the vowel, there were about 1.72, so one and three quarters different pronunciations. But we found that when looking at the number of different pronunciations associated with the vowel when it was paired with the final consonant, 
and went from 3.3 different pronunciations to about 1.3 pronunciations. It became a lot more predictable. So this is all very neat and well and good, except is it actually related to reading performance? That makes sense, right? OK. So what she did was she had skilled adult readers read a whole bunch of these consonant, vowel, consonant words. And she looked to see both their speed and their accuracy in reading the words. So a lot of students at Wayne State got to participate. And they got course credit for reading the words. And what she found is that the college students were much more accurate and faster in reading the words that were more consistent. The more predictable a word was, the fewer mistakes people made, and the more quickly they read the words. When looking at the errors that people made, what tended to be more consistent, what predicted accuracy, it seemed that people the patterns of errors seem to reflect the consistency with the vowel consonant units rather than the initial consonant vowel units. So it looked like the onset and rhyme was a really meaningful unit that translated to looking at the graphemes. So what implication do you see that for teaching reading and spelling in school? that people depend more on the rhymes, having words grouped this way. What implication do you see that? That this does seem to be a psychologically meaningful way of breaking words apart, and that these are more predictable than vowels by themselves? So how do you want to introduce vowels? to kids? How, how do you want, you have to teach the vowels, but how, how are you going to teach them reading words, strategies for reading words? Are you going to focus just on isolation, or are you going to show them in the context of words? In the context of words, and the words that you want to have, instead of having words like cab and can and cash and call and um, cane, where it's unpredictable, you're going to want to instead do cat, hat, bat, fat, sat, mat. There's a reason why teachers use word families, because of the stability of the rhyme here. The relationship, the greater consistency with the vowel consonant unit, with the pronunciation and the spelling, that it makes English a lot more predictable when you're using these larger chunks. Yeah. So that study only She also did studies um, also by the end of first grade. She was following kids in schools. She's done a lot of work following um, kids' spelling development at different ages, like from kindergarten through adulthood. So not only is it in adulthood that you find them sensitive, but by the end of first grade, children start using these word families. They start showing sensitivity. They might not be consciously aware that they're doing it, but when you find that they're able to read words faster in the order of milliseconds consistently, that suggests that it plays a psychological reality, that representation is important for them. So very often what you find with reading researchers when they're looking at these phenomena is they'll start with adults to see, do you see this immature reading? Is this task feasible? Would it reveal differences? And then you try and replicate it with the kids, who sometimes are more challenging to work with, and also to see how it develops. So in looking at word accuracy, what they found was, what she also found with her colleagues, was that the unit that was a lot more predictive of people's actual reading accuracy was the VC unit instead of the CB unit. So when you look at the actual latencies and accuracy, looking at the predictability, the consistency within the words, 
predicts and influences accuracy in reading and speed in reading. And like I noted, by the end of first grade, and continuing to develop through fifth grade, by fifth grade, sixth grade, kids tend to show more adult-like patterns in reading the single syllable words. What she found is that there is this sort of developmental trend that kids are sensitive. Other people have done work that have replicated this or looking at other features. So for example, Gordon Brown has found that um, words that have a lot of enemies tend to be inaccurately read. So the words that stand out from the crowd, so the spook versus look, hook, cook, people are more likely to make, if you're looking at the double OK group, the word that kids and adults are most likely to make a mistake with are spook. And they also tend to be a little slower. Did you notice when I was reading that poem, there were times that I would slow down? Because I kind of get on that sort of trend. That all reflects an unconscious sensitivity to the statistical frequencies within words and the relationships. And when we find them violating the pattern, you have to sort of overcome what you really want to say, which is going along with the pattern, to be able to come up with that. So I want to thank you for today. If anyone has any further questions, what we're going to be doing is we're going to look at spelling some more um, on Thursday. And on th Thursday, what we're also going to do is we're going to look at activities for building. So we're going to look at the stages of developing spelling skills in school. Um, stages of development, how it relates to reading, and then how to promote those specific activities that take advantage. Thank you.